Hello, I'm Eric Skindred with the Hospital Association of Southern California. Today we're talking with Dr. Regina Chinsio Kwong, who goes by Dr. CK for short. Chinsio Kwong is Deputy Health Officer with OC Healthcare Agency in Orange County. Since joining the agency a year ago, Dr. CK has communicated information on the pandemic, vaccines, and other topics to Orange County residents and to residents across the area via regional media. In the written portion of this interview, she points to openness and empathy as key message attributes that help reluctant listeners hear messages, whether they're delivered by her or by other healthcare professionals. First of all, thank you, Dr. C.K. It's great to have you here today. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much for inviting me. When I spoke with you two weeks ago, there was an even greater sense of the unknown regarding the Omicron variant. This week, there seems to be an impression developing that the new variant may produce milder illness. So, today is Monday, December 6. Why don't you share your latest outlook on Omicron and also on Delta and influenza? How bad might it get this winter? What can we do, as people concerned with public health, to ensure that any surge stays as small as possible? Thank you for that question. Um, First of all, Omicron, well, so far it seems that it's been a milder illness. That's been reassuring. I think it's still really early to really know the impact um, because we do know that with all of these different variants, it does take time for us to see the hospitalization numbers go up. Um, so I think it's it's still pretty early. Um, we just need more time to really understand more about Omicron. Um, I, I guess my biggest concern with Omicron is that because of the mutations and where they appear um, on the spike protein, there is likely to be um, the current therapeutics that we have, which is the monoclonal antibody, may not be as effective. And then there's also a concern that the current vaccines may not be as effective against the um, Omicron compared to previous variants. Good news is that we have seen that a lot of the cases that have been detected that are now here in the United States are pretty much fully vaccinated individuals who have very mild symptoms. So hopefully we continue to just see that and, and not anything more severe. As we get into the winter, we know that more people are staying indoors and they're gathering indoors. November, December tends to be two months full of many different celebrations. I think we're all tired (laughs) of COVID. Um, So it's not, um, we do expect more and more people to gather and celebrate, but at the same time with being indoors, when people are not as careful, this is where transmission can occur, whether that's the flu or a COVID variant anything that spreads through respiratory droplets or is more likely to spread indoors. So I think it's important for us to make sure that if we are gathering indoors, um, that we might be mindful of all the mitigation factors um, and really take every step to reduce our risk, which of course starts with vaccination and getting fully vaccinated. And if you're eligible to get your booster shot and um, get your flu vaccine as well. Um, And then especially when you're around people who are higher risk, wearing a mask is still really important. And maybe just considering removing the mask when you're eating and and keeping some distance. There's so many things that we've learned and the studies do prove that all of these mitigation strategies help reduce the transmission. With that said, in December, you know, we're starting to see some flu cases pop up in Orange County. It's still really low compared to other States, but we do see other states already seeing a rise in flu cases. And because we haven't had flu um, locally in the last year and people really didn't get vaccinated the, last, the previous year, there's a risk of really having no immunity in the community, which leads to increased flu cases um, that we should expect this winter. Um, and unfortunately, If we have flu rising, we potentially will also have COVID cases rising, which is not a good situation for the hospital system um, because we know that the hospital system really gets burdened and strained during this period. And I know this period is also unique in that all the healthcare workers are really burnt out on the front lines and have been serving the community and the patients 
for the last 20 plus months and they're all really tired, but we still have to take care of patients and unfortunately deal with the surges that may occur. Okay, you've become a high profile voice on coronavirus and the pandemic and the need for people to step up and play an active role. You've done dozens of media interviews. Did you anticipate such a public role when you joined OCHCA? Um, I knew I knew the position would be very public, and um, I joined HC at a time where, you know, we didn't have vaccines yet, and I knew vaccines were around the corner, and um, it, getting vaccinated would be cornerstone to our success in getting out of the pandemic. And um, as a family physician, I really care about the community and patients, but it, when you're so strained with trying to get your patients' resources and um, uh, from testing to vaccination, I felt like I needed to play a big, I need to help out with the community a little bit more. Um, and so that's why I also reached out to the HC and offered <laughs> to assist. Um, you know, I was hoping also that my experience from being in the military would help with strategizing and how to operationalize anything that was needed to get our community um, either vaccinated or tested or get to a better place. Um, so, so, no, so I, didn't, actually, I, didn't, okay. I didn't know that I would be on the news or on all these media outlets, but I, you know, I recognize that as a physician, just being a physician in general, our role is to educate. It's educating individuals. It's educating the community about health and how we can do better. So I'm, I'm, more than, I'm happy to be involved with all the media efforts to make sure the right, correct message goes out to the community. So you reached out to the Orange County Agency as the pandemic progressed? That's kind of a gutsy move. It's partially, well, I, I knew that they needed help. As I know, um, I also watched the news like many other people that summer um, where the previous health officer resigned. And I, I felt almost traumatized by that because I felt like at a time when we're going through a pandemic and a crisis, um, we, you know, the physician leaders at the top really needed to be supported to continue to educate the community on the right steps to get us away from this COVID pandemic. And I, I feel so bad that it's been so politicized, but, you know, we have a role in standing our ground and making sure that we can give the right recommendations to the community. Um, so I, I, I eventually I did think about it, um, and I finally, sometime in Early, early fall, I finally went ahead and applied. Wow, I wanted to be part of the solution, and I didn't want to complain about <laughs> the different gaps that existed. I wanted to be part of the solution. You completed your medical residency at Naval Hospital Camp Pendleton while serving in the U.S. Navy, following in the footsteps of your dad, if I'm not mistaken. You also have an interest in integrative medicine. When we spoke last time, you shared your interest in the connection between communication styles and human relationships, if I have that right, and stress and illness. Tell us a bit more about your personal philosophy and your path to becoming the health care professional you are today. Thanks also for that question. Um, I think it just started with always just wanting to be helpful to another individual. Um, I don't know that I always wanted to be a physician, but I was always on the path of helping others. Um, when I was an undergrad, I was an athletic trainer. I was in the path of get, becoming a certified athletic trainer, and it was actually that experience that opened my eyes into considering um, being a physician. Um, and it was because these athletes who came to get help um, to recover from their injuries were actually, actually telling me that they were going to an acupuncturist and they were seeking other alternatives to get better from their injuries. And I was surprised, like, why would a student who really didn't have as much money go out on their own, <clears throat> on their own time with their own money to go ahead and seek these alternative treatments? Because at the time, I really felt that the current physical therapy and the Western medicine, in my sense, was really um, effective. And to my surprise, I learned of a whole new world in medicine, which was, um, I met a physician there at UCLA who also had a clinic where he integrated Chinese medicine um, for the care of patients who had fibromyalgia or chronic fatigue syndrome 
or other um, injuries or illnesses. And it was there that I learned that, you know, medicine is much more than, you know, pills and diagnoses. It, it really needs to be a holistic approach. Um, so from there, I applied to osteopathic medicine school because I felt like I needed to start from a more holistic perspective. And um, luckily, with my experience in the military, the military also was seeking other alternatives to help the troops with their PTSD or any of their injuries. And so luckily, I was able to learn medical acupuncture while I was in the military. So I've come a long way, but I feel like, again, the way to health really is you know, how we um, have purpose in life and how we integrate with everybody else around us, whether that's family or our neighbors. And also, yes, communication is a huge part um, because we are humans. We want to connect. We are social beings. Um, And so it starts with our relationships, and having healthy relationships leads to better health. Um, So, you know, that's just my perspective, and I feel that especially with covid there's a lot to be learned about other things that we can do for ourselves. Yes, all these mitigations are very, very important, um, but we also have to really be mindful of our, our mental health because if our mental health is not strong or healthy, then no matter what we do on the nutrition side or even the medical side, we can potentially still have more severe illness um, and our immune system really takes a hit. So. I'm really thankful for all my experiences, and again, I hope to continue to utilize all that background when I approach public health matters. This week, one of the leading vaccine scientists in the UK, Professor Sarah Gilbert, said it would be a mistake if our current experience doesn't lead to more funding for pandemic preparedness. And, she stated, it's likely that future pandemics will be worse than COVID-19. How can the world get to a safer place when a segment of the planet's population chooses not to take the pandemic seriously? Um, I think there's a lot we need to learn to get to a better place. And I, I, I too, believe that we all need to prepare for future pandemics. I think this pandemic is only the beginning. Um, And pandemics occur because of multiple multiple factors. Um, One, it could be our own health is impacted and Maybe we're not eating health as healthily, and so our bodies are not as resilient against the infections that surround us. But there's also other things that are happening around us in our environment. The soil is becoming more depleted of nutrients. Um, environmentally, we've got all kinds of toxins surrounding us. Surrounding us. Um, we've got global warming that also may be impacting how illnesses arise and um, infect us as well as, you know, other animals um, around the world. And so I think it's just that perfect storm um, to really lead to worse conditions and unfortunately possibly further pandemics. Um, And then there's this issue of equity. Um, So not everybody has access, um, health access or equity. And You're seeing that in many of the countries around the world who don't yet have good access to vaccine. And now we're also dealing with social media and the impacts of social media on how we connect with each other and how we get information. And unfortunately, a lot of the information that's being spread includes information that does not support vaccine, which is unfortunate. Um, And unfortunately, unfortunately, people become more biased in uh, their thoughts or what they believe with this pandemic because they continuously are fed more information that sides with what they're biased towards. Um, Again, we're social beings. We want to be validated in whatever we think or whatever we feel. And so if we feel that a certain group or idea or information supports and validates us, then we're more likely to continue to follow that thought process, whether it's right or wrong, Um, and somehow we have to get beyond and connect to people who are perhaps going down a path that is not going to lead to better health, but unfortunately will lead to decisions that may cause them to have worsening health. Um, 
I think there's so much work that needs to be done, but I don't think that social media, I think social media, unfortunately, has played uh, a role in polarizing our thoughts and dividing us um, globally. Okay, well, we're coming up on time. Is there anything else you'd like to share with our listeners, either on the immediate public health outlook or anything else? Um, I, I just I just hope we get through the next couple of months. I hope that, you know, um, the hospital system, at least locally, doesn't get as strained. Um, hopefully people are making the right decisions to continue to keep themselves safe and their families safe and the community safe. And I'm hoping our culture will change to be more of one that cares for each other um, and and less on the individual, but more on community health and how we have a role um, in making decisions that will, you know, our decisions we make for ourselves really impact everyone around us, and we have to take that to heart. Um, so I'm hoping we get to a better place. I think there is a lot of positive things that came out of covid I've seen a lot of positive things out on the ground, how people came together to really help in the community. And a lot of people in the hospitals who are, are so burnt out still are, are finding ways to support each other as they continue to care for the patients who really need the care. And um, there's also been a lot of community collaboration, which is really exciting to see. Um, so I'm hoping that more of that comes out and we see less of the negativity and hopefully we learn to be more social um, in more positive social ways um, to help bring each other up um, instead of tearing each other down for whatever we believe in or our thoughts. Um, I'm hoping next year will be much better <laughs> than it was in 2021 and 2020. Okay then, well thank you very much for joining us, Dr. C.K. Thank you, and take care. Thank you.